What was it about the talk show form or genre that felt like kind of an ideal vessel for what you wanted to do? Uh, it's the oldest format in television, one of the oldest formats in television, in the history of television, and it's, um, it's both very structured, but it's very easy to deviate from the structure when necessary. So, you, so it's, it, it leaves room for a tangent. Um, and I don't know, I just like all my influences were like mock talk shows. Like it's like, a, it's not making fun of talk shows. It's celebrating mock talk shows. So Tom Green show, Jiminy Glick, Space Ghost, Ollie G show. Those were like my biggest influences. Those were the shows that made me laugh the hardest. Yeah. Have you ever like talked shop with any of those people? Like, a yeah, yeah. I've, yeah. Been to, I've been to Sasha's house. I've been to Tom's, Tom Green's house, you know. Those guys are so sweetie pies. Those are, they're, and they're like my forefathers. Mike Lazo, who invented, who created Space Ghost, you know, with Keith Crawford, they they run. I mean, Lazo just retired, but they you know run Adult Swim. So obviously, I've been working with them intimately for like a decade. Um, yeah, never been Martin Short, but I've got to work with most of my heroes. It's pretty cool. That's incredible. Yeah. Um, so each season of this show has you ha- you have kind of a wildly different body transformation look. The yeah. production design shifts. What was sort of the process behind season five's look? Well, I just wrote down. I didn't know how I was gonna look. I just wrote down. I was like, what would it be? What would I look like if I did the opposite of everything I did the previous season? So the previous season, season four, I lost weight. I got pale. I put, uh, I grew up my fingernails. I never brushed or washed my hair. I grew up my hair. I get this ratty cheek hair that comes in. I didn't wear deodorant. I didn't wash the suit once. Um, I looked like really ratty and like kind of like a prisoner, uh, like in like a North, North Korea detention center. The season five, I did everything the opposite. I gained weight. I got really tan. I bleached my teeth. I not only wore deodorant, but I wore a ton of brute cologne. I got rid of all my body hair, including my pubic hair. I waxed. I nared my legs. I shaved my armpits. I bicked my head bald. The only hair I kept were my eyebrows. Um, and, uh, yeah, I looked like uh, Vin Diesel six weeks after he died. <laughs> post more than Vin Diesel. Mm-hmm. Uh, what does it do to your guests, the kind of like visceral, the scent-based sort of stuff? Can you Do you see like it fuck with them in a certain way? Yeah, I think so. If somebody like you don't know very well gives you a big hug and they either smell like rancid body odor or they smell like a ton of cheap Kmart cologne, you're going to have a reaction. You're going to be like, I'm dealing with like a different type of person. Yeah. And what is kind of the... What is the difference between having a guest on the show who maybe doesn't know what they're in for versus someone who is at least passingly familiar with what you tend to do to the guests? Well, we always aim for the guest that doesn't even know my name and is just looking for screen time. That's the best. But if they do know me, it doesn't matter. We got the show down to a science where it doesn't matter how well they know me or the show if, you know, cockroaches are exploding out of the desks and you know, my clothes are falling off and stuntmen are falling from the sky. They're going to have a reaction. So, you know. uh, Why torture America's sweetheart, Judy Greer? You know what? Judy Greer was the best. Yeah? Was the best. She was so sweet. She came on. She, she, we got her. I think she's, I think she's a fan of the show. But she was so like, overwhelmed. <laughs> but you know, it's never mean spirited. There's never malicious intent because it's not dumb fun or funny. It's not fun for me. You know, I'm a benevolent terrorist. So <laughs> I, I, I'm just I'm just doing it to blow people's minds and cram in absurdity into reality and distort the truth. I'm never looking to hurt anyone's feelings. Where are you headed? I'm gonna like eat. Nice. What are you having? Uh, pickled vegetables and some rice. Who's that on your shirt? Lisa Gale. Uh, why do I know that name? Who is that? She sings the three second rule. Yes. Thank you. I love that. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, she's awesome. Um, so Good. benevolent terrorist. <laughs> that chorus is objectively good. I got to say. Yeah, I like that song. The benevolent terrorist idea, does that apply to when you do the more like random man on the street hidden camera stuff? Or are you kind of like, yeah. 
Yeah, I'm a I'm a benevolent terrorist there as well. I'm not, well, how do you how do you kind of harm anybody or hurt anybody's feelings? I'm looking to blow people's minds and have a have a bizarre uh, distort somebody's reality. So how do you do react when people kind of have a what seems to me like an emotionally volatile sort of reaction? You know, um, I'll be honest with you. The people that are seem the most angry when we cut and we go, surprise, you're in a hidden camera show. There's the cameras. They're the most, they, they tend to be the most relieved and the most happy. And those are the people that laugh the hardest after the, the prank is revealed and we have to get the, get the release for nine times out of 10. It's usually like the soccer moms and the Karens that have this like quiet, like stewing, brewing anger, yes. like seething anger that are, A, don't give the best reaction to B, are, aren't too happy after the prank. So, so usually those really volatile people are like so relieved that it's a prank show that they're like, oh yeah, you know. That's but, good. You know, you gotta crack, you gotta crack a few eggs to make an omelet. That you do. Um, speaking of cracking eggs, you, the art of your obliteration of your set each episode is really something I marvel at, especially in this new season. Technically, stunt wise. How do you plan these sequences and execute these sequences? Um, just like we plan any any other part of the show, you know, it's case by case what what needs to get done. But now we got the show down to a science; we know what's like producible and not producible. So, like when you tackle the drummer of your new band through the wall, yeah, is that like you? You're like landing on a pad. You have a stunt performer you're working with. What is that like? I used to. I used to not use any pads, not use stunt people. I would like wipe out on the concrete and pledge my body. Now we have like a stunt coordinator and I kind of like <laughs> do it the proper way. <laughs> Cause I was like putting myself in the hospital every time. I still went to the hospital this year. What for? Uh, John Cena threw me through a shelf, which is fine. He did the stunt properly. But then after the stunt, the shelf fell over and the fr frame of the shelf, which is metal, clocked me in the head. And I got Jeez. Mm -hmm. Jeez, Louise. Oh. So we... No fault of John Cena's. It was more my art department's fault. <laughs> uh, so John Cena's on this. The episodes I've seen, we have like Anderson Pock, Machine Gun Kelly, Lamorne Morris. You seem to have a way to get these folks to come and clown for like just one bit or one line even Macaulay yeah. Culkin with the chainsaw what mm -hmm. do you think it is that like appeals to these people to come play for a second I mean now we have fans of the show like Macaulay Culkin's like a super fan yeah so it makes it easier to book um, um it's a quarter hour show you gotta keep it moving like I can only cram so many jokes in I don't I'm not stretching for time you know what I mean I was curious about that. It is such like a relentlessly paced show. Yeah. When you're when you're shooting it, does it feel that quickly moving, or is it more? Huh. Yeah. So, what? What? Yeah. Every interview is like an hour. Wow. And you know, setting up a hidden camera setup is very tedious. You know, hidden camera means hidden crew, so it's like really cumbersome. Like it's already very slow shooting something scripted. If if it was a scripted show, so imagine like all the like tedious measures a scripted crew goes through times 10 because then you have to like hide the crew and like seduce an unsuspecting pedestrian into the kill zone and then like you know blow their mind you know it's very 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 slow moving yeah um and the, the editing process is you know tedious too i was wondering about the editing this it, it feels very you know, it's obviously frenetic and it's prone to like the moment that really tickled me was like the when the everyone starts singing that kind of like weird Christian song abruptly and you like put someone else's face on someone. Are you in the editing room often? Kind of making Wait, these what which bit is that? There's this thing in like the first episode of the new season where randomly someone would start singing like I will praise you or something like that. Is it in the studio or in the street? Street. 
Oh, in the street. What street bit is that? I don't know. It, it it was a post gag. You like added it in editing. I can't remember what the bit is though. What the, what the pre- what's what's the premise of the segment? Do you remember? No, no, top of your head. Um, maybe it was fucking with the uh, city surveyor. Oh, oh, praise to the Lord! Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. Are you in like the editing grandpa. room, like hitching? Yeah. That no. kind of- <laughs> It's a it's a group effort. It's like all my editors, my director, and I. Uh, yeah, I'm in there all. When we're in post production, I'm in the editing bay all day, every day. Yeah, bouncing around. We have a team of editors bouncing around, editor to editor, and we'll have like friends and family screenings to see what's actually funny and not working or confusing or needs clarity. Like, it is a uh, slow and steady process. Yeah, is there anything through this kind of slow? cutting down to the diamonds stuff that you've lost that you're particularly like god i wish we could have kept that in um there's always like yeah there 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 always there are always those moments but uh you know you gotta kill darlings that's like part of the process yeah you know if it's something that like i had to cut for time but it's killing me i can always like throw it up online or do like a extended dance remix cut you know oh hell yeah um, is there anything that made it into this season that you were either like, there's no way we can pull this off or adults Swim was like, are you sure you want to do this? Anything you're surprised made it to the final cut? No, not really. I think like there's some pranks that I'm so happy we pulled off so well. Like we did this prank where I like, there was, we we're like on a construction site right on the East river in Brooklyn and there was this construction worker doing construction and I came out of the water dressed like a mafia guy with cement bricks on my feet. And I was like dragging, like dragging myself out the water. I was like, help, help me. I was like, and this construction worker was totally on the hook. He was like, what the fuck's going on, man? I was like, I got mixed up with the wrong crowd. These guys threw me off a boat. They put me in cement shoes and threw me off a boat last night. And he's like, oh my God, you look fucked up. And he was like, so on the hook for this ridiculous mafia premise that like i think it's our greatest uh greatest prank achievement i can't wait to see that yeah with these random folks on the street do you try to engage with them the way that like an improv comedian would engage with a scene partner are they like a sparring partner or are you trying to just kind of do your thing to them so to speak I'm, yeah, I'm just trying to get them to react to the situation and believe the situation. Mm-hmm. That's what it's it's about, like, buying into the, like, surreal, you know, situation and then, like, reacting and being, like, on the hook and being invested in it, you know? Yeah. So that's, that's, the, that's the key. Um, what does it feel like to be so memed from this show? So, so many elements of this have become memes that are passed around. Is that, is that weird or surreal? No, that's awesome. Those memes kept the momentum alive between season four and season five because I had to take so much time off to make the movie. Uh, the movie didn't come out because of Corona. It's coming out next year. So the memes, you know, I, and I, that I can't even take credit for, kept the momentum, build the fan base of the show, kept the momentum alive. I like, you know, I was selling out theaters and and the largest venues I've ever performed at on this tour I did last fall. And I hadn't even been on the air for three and a half years, four years. So to me, like, I don't know if it was all the memes, but the memes kept hope alive. Kept the momentum alive. It was pretty incredible. As they do for all of us. You're you're referring to Bad Trip, the movie you shot? Yeah. I was curious when what 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 are the plans for us being able to see that thing? Yeah, it's coming out on Netflix. So we, uh, you know, we we're going to premiere it South by Southwest this year. We we're going to be in theaters everywhere this year, and then Corona happened like a week before South by Southwest. So it was devastating. But then Netflix saw the movie and loved it and bought it off MGM. So it's going to come out next year on Netflix. Um, I, I probably can't say that. I'm probably not allowed to say the date yet, but. Um, uh, thank God it's on Netflix because Netflix is like, there's no b- greater venue than a streaming service that has 200 million subscriptions. I think they went from like 118 million subscribers to like 200 million subscribers in like 
six months of quarantine. So we're kind of at the best, you know, venue in town um, to thank God. So, and they're really excited about the movie. So unfortunately we have to wait even longer for it to come out, but when it comes out, it's going to be glorious. I can't wait. Were there any kind of key differences or expansions with like producing man on the street, hidden camera stuff for TV versus film? Film was even harder, not because of like the production setup, but like each scene in the film, it's a narrative film. So each scene in the film required the story to progress more and more. So we're looking Mm. for plot points from real people. So not only are we pranking people, but we're like trying to pull plot points out of them to motivate our characters. You know, it was me, Lil Rel, Howry, and Tiffany Haddish. You know, we're trying to like pull plot out of people as we're fucking with them, which is like an extra step of, you know, difficulty. So it was, uh, it was definitely a new challenge. Yeah. What were uh, Lil Rel and Tiffany like to be kind of your partners in crime? Had they done this kind of stuff before? Tiffany had. Rel never had it. Rel fucking hated it. He was like, this is so <laughs> stressful. He's like, this is so fucking stressful. He was like having, he was good at it. You know, the crime was like, I was like, you're fucking good at it. Like when he's in its own, once you call action, he would do it. But he hated it. Tiffany had done it before and she, um, She's just like the funniest person on earth. I mean, she's like comedy on a cellular level and there's no medium of comedy that she can't do. Hitting camera pranks, stand up, acting, like writing, whatever. Anything you need her to do. She, there's a reason she's a movie star. You know what I mean? She's truly like just fucking incredible. Yes, she is. Um, speaking of other avenues of comedy, I'm really intrigued by Connected, which you do a voice in. Oh, um, yeah. What was it like? What's it like being a voice actor versus kind of a on-screen performer? I love it because you can be so hyped up and animated. You don't have to like internalize your emotions. In fact, you want to like, you really want to take it to the nines because it, it gives the animator something to animate and we only hear the voice. We don't see the face. So uh, live action acting is difficult because you have to be very emotional but internalize it. This, you can just go to the moon, and I'm already a human cartoon, you know, so it's a perfect, perfect life for me. What was kind of the most fun or exciting uh, uh, bit or gag you did in Connected that you're just, like, jazzed for folks to see? I, like, deep-throated a burrito. Hell yeah. (laughs) Hell yeah. (laughs) (laughs) Was it, um... Speaking of voice acting, was it surreal to get the call to be in the Disney live action Lion King? What 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 was <laughs> yeah, that? Yeah, you like? know, my, my reaction was more surreal. Somebody called me like Hey dude, I had a mole on the insider friend that like worked there. She was like, Hey, they're gonna make you an offer for the Lion King. I just wanted to let you know. Congrats. And I was so busy with work. I think I was working on Bad Trip at the time trying to finish it that I was like, uh, Lion King, I probably can't do that. I, I think I'm busy. And my agent was like, dude, it's the fucking Lion King. You got to do it. What do you think? What, what are you thinking? And I was like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so it was great. I got to meet Beyonce. What's she like? She's very nice. What did y'all, what do you talk about with Beyonce? She was regal. I mean, I said, hi, nice to meet you. And that was like <laughs> the beginning and end of the conversation. Yeah. You know. Well, that's, I'm glad to hear she's nice. Um, yeah. She's nice to me. Uh, so Collider, the outlet I'm interviewing you for, we're huge pop star fans. Oh, nice. I just cackle at the CMZ scenes. Mm-hmm. What, what was it like setting up and playing in those scenes? Were those mostly improvised, or did you have free reign? Yeah, like- they were. They were. They were scripted, but like improvisation heavily encouraged. And and it was like, you know, it's the Lonely Island guys and Berbiglia, Chelsea, Will Arnett. You know what I mean? It's people that are like great comedic minds. So like, I think the majority of the final cut was like heavily improvised stuff. You know, so. It was great because we could just go to the fucking moon and 
yeah, Will Arnett's so funny. <laughs> Chelsea and Birbiglia are so funny. They're, they, you know, I was like padded. I would, I was like comfortable because I was like padded with very, very funny people. I didn't have to like, work so hard. Yeah, it makes the job easier. Um, mm-hmm. w- the way I think I first was introduced to you as a comedy voice was on your role on Don't Trust the Bee in Apartment 23. Hmm. And you've also done, you had like a recurring role on Two Broke Girls. Yep. Being kind of a piece of a more traditional narrative network sitcom versus what you're doing now, what what does it feel like that says about where your career is going? What are some of the differences there? Um, Don't Trust the Bee in Apartment 23, I like because it had like a 30 rock kind of comedic sensibility. Um, and I really like Nanachka Khan who created it. Um, and also I was flat broke when I booked it. <laughs> so part of it was like <laughs> survival. Yeah. Uh, two broke girls. I always felt like I had to like prove I could do a traditional comedy. I don't know why I felt like I needed to do that or who I needed to do that for. I felt like, I was like, well, Miles Davis had to put out Kind of Blue before he like switched to Fusion. But looking back on that, I didn't need to do that at all. <laughs> you know, I mean, some stuff I did like, some of those multi-cam sitcoms I did, even like guest stars and stuff like that, which is out of necessity because I was broke. But I don't think I did. I'm not like an actor for hire. I think I want to like only be in stuff that I'm, I am I participate in the writing of. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. Um, shifting back to your show, uh, the dynamic between you and Hannibal Burris, the on-screen dynamic, are those in any way planned in the writer's room, or is he just kind of reacting in the No, moments? I don't think Hannibal has ever re- read a script for the Eric Andre show in his life. Uh, he just comes on, and, he, and it, honestly, it's better that way. It's yeah. almost like his process. And we've just known each other for 10, 15 years. You know what I mean? So we have a comfort. And he was there from the very, very beginning of the show. He's always a fellow. So, uh, yeah, it's heavily improvised. And we'll give him a little hand props and suggestions, stuff he can play with. You know what I mean? I do want to ask about the inception of maybe my favorite bit from your whole show, the one I keep rewatching, uh, his Morpheus rap. Oh, yeah. It's, yeah. it's just such sublime nonsense. Yeah. Where did that come from? What was it like to pitch? It was like we were in the writer's room and we were like trying to squeeze out ideas and like either Kitao or I, like we pitched it as like a exhausted end of the day kind of idea. (laughs) I was like, I thought I pitched it, but Kitao swears that he pitched it. It was one of us going like, uh, uh, what if Hannibal comes on, he's dressed like Morpheus, and he just says Morpheus, Dorpheus, <laughs> Morpheus. <laughs> like, purposely bad idea. <laughs> and then we were dying. We were dying because it was such a bad idea. And then we pitched it to Hannibal, or we just, like, put him in that outfit. He did one take, and he was like, what is this bit? And we're like, you just rhyme the word Morpheus, dresses Morpheus. And then he was like, that's it? And I was like, that is it. I was like, okay, so the majority of that is his second take. And then he just like, he was like, I'm going to fucking nail this. Any opportunity he has to rap, he, he takes it. Where did the uh, the button on that, the coffin and the 40, how did that uh, get thrown in there? Uh, I think I wrote in the script, like, he drinks a 40 in a coffin, and then, like, he came up with a line, Morpheus drinking a 40 in a death basket. <laughs> <laughs> he's fucking nuts wild um a couple more questions for you is there i know we just finished and we're about to see season five is there are there talks about season six of the eric andre show yeah i mean you have to ask the network <laughs> if it's up to me yeah first please but i think like the fifth season probably has to air first before they order more yeah, makes sense to me. Um, yeah. Uh, final question for you, kind of a broad one. Watching, especially this new season, what does it take these days to be like absurd or all of these words are in quotes, absurd, shocking, transgressive, disruptive? I feel like we've seen so much weird shit, not only as comedy consumers, but just as people in this weird, fucked up time. What's kind of your strategy for cutting through all that noise? 
Uh, I think like instead of academically being like, I, it must be absurd. You just have to like be authentic and authentic to yourself. And if something doesn't feel authentic, don't do it. I think people respond to authenticity. Yeah, simple. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. Thanks so much for your time, Eric. This was yeah, great. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Nice to meet you.